church say, this is a nitty gritty church. Sometimes being the real church, it's not easy to serve God. And people will, and then they, they teach us to become a hypocrite. Because now, once I, when I'm serving God faithfully, I become a target for the enemy. Because now I'm a real threat. You didn't really care about me because I was living in and out and I wasn't really effective. There was no real power in my life. But once I put both feet in and I got my dominion and power authority, you came after me. And now you came after me. Well, if I show you what I'm going through, now you're going to judge me even in the church. So you've taught me how to compromise myself because you wouldn't give me a safe place to be real. Because if I was real, you would want to do, come on, you know it. Oh, sit them down. Oh, put them out. Ooh, are you crazy? Call is call. Purpose is purpose. Purpose is formed before a person was. God has a way of dealing. And I'm not talking about living a life of compromise, but I am talking about doing things the way the word of God declares how we're to handle it unmet expectations and disappointments. And we all like to deal with the prodigal son because the elder one's too close because the reality is we've all sat in church and been disappointed. We've all walked through life serving God faithfully and it didn't turn out the way we thought it should turn out. Hurt. And so it teaches me and trains me not to have an honest expression of feelings but to repress and deny the feelings. And then here's the real danger, to use other channels to express it. So now, when I suppress and deny, it's going to come out somehow. So now what would have been a safe place just for me to say, I'm ticked, I'm hurting, I'm mad, I'm upset, I'm confused, I don't have that, so guess what, it's going to manifest here. Now I really am going to get myself in trouble. Because I don't want to dip beneath the baseline, and I don't want to live in a place that is low. But I don't have anyone I can reach to. I know I'm in somebody's stuff right in the house of God. And so what happens is people begin to judge you even more. Now that's a conference. I learned how to be a hypocrite in church. That's a conference. So, so <laughs> people, people, I'm going to call it, I'm going to call forth the conference. I learned how to be a hypocrite in church. So people will sugarcoat their hostility. And when you sugarcoat your hostility, you can never grow. You never grow beyond it. They live in a life of false pretense. That's wearing a mask. And the damage of wearing a mask what something that conceals you or disguises you is that I become shut off from the awareness of my problems, from the awareness of my struggles because I'm denying them and even more so from the awareness of God's solutions of his ability, his desire, and his resources to transform me. And when someone wears a mask, they're on a mission to represent themselves as perfect. Let me tell you something real clear. No one is perfect except Jesus. No one is perfect. No one's perfect. There's only one perfect man. We're all going from glory to glory. So give yourself a break. Give the person sitting next to you a break. Please give your spouse a break. Give your children a break. Give the people that work with you and around you a break. Give them a little bit of permission to struggle with their contradictions. Yes, they love God, but give them this much permission to work through their humanity. Who I'm going to help you out today. Because when someone is on a mission to be perfect, then they use their family, their work, their abilities, religion to project, watch what I'm saying real carefully, an image, because that's all it is, an image of perfection. And it's the image because it's only one perfect man. Now, you know that's the truth. That's why we're all in shock when we hear something. Woo, we didn't know that. Well, why are we really in shock? Because the reality is everybody deals with dilemmas. Everybody's going to deal with it. And some people are just more equipped to work with them. Some people are more skilled and have the tools to get through the difficulties. But one of the greatest tools is, do I have a safe place to deal with all of my disappointment? Do I have a safe place to express myself and come in and get real healing? Because when I have to be perfect, perfectionism means you expect me to be free from faults. So when you're per too perfectionistic on yourself or on others, you expect them, have an expectation that they have no faults. Everybody's got faults. Everybody's going to pluck your nerves sooner or later. Everybody's going to disappoint you sooner or later. It's life. 
Look at somebody and say, I've got a word from God for you today. Tell them, say, there's a word the pastor has. So the perfectionist expects a path toward any goal and their entire journey through life to be direct, to be smooth, to be free from obstacles. But here's the deal. That's not reality. That's just fantasy. Because real life has pitfalls. And real life has problems. And here's one of the most basic things that you have to understand. And then I'm going to take you right there. The most basic need to every human being is the need for significance. Because significance means I matter. I have value. Significance says I'm worthy. That I'm not an accident. That there's value to my life. More than wanting money. More than wanting any other thing. They say that the number one motivator in everyone's life is to feel significant. That I have purpose. That I have value. And so if the most watched need in a person's life is significance... And if we have this expectation of people, especially in the church, that faith produces a certain outcome, because my, my way of believing is that your faith carries you through life, faith doesn't prevent life. But if we paint this picture of I have to be significant and my faith produces a certain outcome, then here's the problem. Maybe that's why we perpetuated a structure that is sick and systemic. And systemic literally means it's embedded within and spread throughout. And it affects a group, a system, or a society as a whole. So if I need to feel significant and the structure that validates my value by a false sense of showing you that my faith is working when my life is falling apart, then I'm not going to show you the real me. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to be a hypocrite or have a false appearance because it's not safe within this systemic structure because we look like we don't love God enough or have enough faith and some just wrong and jacked up about that. Let me show you. I wrote on my Facebook last night and this is worth saying. I love to talk about this. Just get it open. I wrote on my Facebook, Pastor Harry, and I said, can't wait, excited about service. I mean, I was up till 2 or 3 a.m., etc. And I said, everybody, without Walls family, wear your pink. And somebody wrote back, this was their response, you don't need to wear pink, you need to wear Jesus. Well, this is what I felt like saying. <laughs> what the... Okay, you fill in the blank, because your cuss word might be different than mine. I was going to say, what the corn? No, come on. <laughs> Okay, what the, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, I, and you just, you, you want to go, you just want to go, help me, Jesus. Because, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean I just need to wear Jesus? I wear Jesus 24-7. I wear Jesus. Jesus is a healer. I believe him. I have faith. I trust him. I lay hands on the sick. I watch them recover. I see the dead raised. And I also buried my daughter. You gonna tell me not to wear pink? Don't make me go Mississippi on you. There is a trailer park girl under this cute little outfit. I can bite, scratch, pull your hair out, and claw your eyes at the... Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, say, I think she's talking to you right now. And here's one of the things I've noticed in pastoring. I've noticed something that's, that's, that's kind of troubling to me. That too often the church seems to be so preoccupied with the dysfunctional. It's the bad boys that get all the attention. And I kind of understand why. We focus our efforts and, and the type on the type and shadow of the prodigal son. And I get why we do that. Because it's a quick way of giving people a picture of how much God can do to the obvious. So you were a heroin addict yesterday and you're delivered today. Okay, you were in prison and you murdered five people and you were an adulterer and you did this and you were that and you that. And today you are a family man. And I get it. I get it. Praise God for all that. But I have a little bit of a challenge when we only display the display. 
dysfunctional because we forget about the ones who have been faithful and we don't say anything about the man who keeps going home 38 years, night after night, working his behind off, providing for his family, making sure that his wife has a meal on the table. Now we talk about the testimony of the mom and I'm grateful that God provided for the single mom, but I'm real thankful for the man who stayed there 38 years and kept providing and kept going and kept bringing his family to church. I'm really thankful for him. And he's not the one that gets all the loud applause and the praise. And he's not the one. And she's not the one when she stood through thick and thin and kept on loving instead of hating. And here's my, I mean, I'm glad for the prodigal son. I like his testimony. But what I'm concerned about is we neglect the faithful. And the problem in doing that, y'all better be seated for a minute because I'm going to go here. The problem in doing that, instead of complimenting those who have stayed, those who are faithful, we continue to promote those who have been dysfunctional. And if you've been faithful, this can cause confusion. This can cause confusion because you feel, because remember, my number one need is to feel significant. And so you feel, now I'm going to bring it home, guys. Ready? This is not, this isn't you here. Okay, this is not here. It's hard because in my mind, I go, okay, I can go to New York, have a church of 10,000 like that. Go to Atlanta, have a church of 10,000 like that. But then you come home to a city that was harder for me. You go out and you preach and people are like, ah, Paula, and you come home and they're like, mm, preach to us, Paula. Because I'm faithful here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. Oh, no, don't stay with me. And that, see, I'm saying the same. You're faithful on your job. You're faithful in your home. You're faithful to this church. You're faithful in your... And here's the dilemma. Because deep down, I know that God promotes and rewards faithfulness. But it seems like I'm not getting the party. Like I'm not getting the celebration. Oh, I'm going to help somebody. And so you feel overlooked. You feel undervalued. You feel unimportant. And you begin to ask, do I even really matter? Because people tend to overlook your faithfulness and your loyalty. And yet God declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2, Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So God gives favor to people who he can trust. People who are faithful and obedient. So to obey is not always an easy thing. Because your praise is not really a praise until you learn how to praise under pressure. Because what it's easy to praise God when everything's going right. It's easy when the husband comes home and he loves you and when, when the dog's just sitting there and up like this on you and the kids are all getting their raise and everybody's eating their Captain Crunch and everybody's doing nice and good. We got a little bit of savings in the account and everybody's happy and we're going to church. How do I praise God, though, under pressure when the doctor says you're going to die, when your mind is hurting because you can't can't see direction and you can't see any kind of light because it's so dark in your life or your heart is broken and bleeding or you've just been rejected by those that you have spent your life with acceptance and you've been giving to how do you praise you don't really have praise until you get under pressure because your praise is just really calisthenics it's thank you God until you go through hell that says I'm gonna praise you when I don't even see a reason feel a reason or no reason but here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna bless the Lord at all times and his praise is going to continually be in my mouth and I'm going to lift up my hands and say you are my redeemer and I love you I love you with an ever I love you Lord be seated I'm going to take it home so, so what happens while God requires faithfulness it's often the person that hangs in there that's overlooked so people take you for granted and when you get taken for granted you feel like do I have value in other words, here's the real issue. You're not the crisis. So attention always goes to where the crisis is. So the prodigal son's the crisis because it's the squeaky wheel 